Yeah, it's Rob Simmons, uh, Unite, and also Social Security. So although I've maybe got some disagreements probably with Bob, there's some of the content that he'd, he'd, he'd said there that I would agree with, you know, that uh, you know, people have the right to maintain and keep their home if they're in council housing. And there's some good points about people who are investing into their homes and why should they be kicked out. So there's some good points, but you know, there is maybe a disagreement, I, I think, is, you know, I think as a councillor, I think you've got a right to be able to say, I'm standing as, as a councillor and this is the, the stand I'm taking on issues and be able to make that clear rather than saying as I'm speaking as an individual. But I think it's only other points you touched upon, like you're saying about your, your family who came into this area, because I remember as, a, as an apprentice at the small arms factory and that the uh, uh, people I worked with, you know, that if they had worked in Stevenage or Harlow, and it's unbelievable to think of it now, that you, know, you could get married in the 1970s or maybe in the 80s, and as soon as you got married, you get a council house. You know, it's, it's something you think now, you know, are we ever going to see those days again? And it's quite unbelievable to think it was, it was possible then. So, but also, a lot of the content I think what uh, Jacob was coming out with was, was really good. And uh, before Christmas, I attended a TUC meeting, in, in uh, a local TUC meeting, in Welling Garden City, where uh, <coughs> there was, um, I'm not sure what, what uh, nationality this guy was, but I think he was, he was possibly from uh, the east, Eastern, I don't know, not Eastern Europe, but I suspect maybe some from the Middle East. And he was sort of rounding on, on uh, Muslims and saying that, you know, that, you know we, we, sh we shouldn't be supporting Muslims and we should, you know, and, uh, you know, and we were sort of trying to sort of argue and I'll, you know, the point I wanted to raise with him is that, you know, uh, that you know, we're, we're workers, you know, whether there is, you know, we're, you know, we're gypsies or whatever, you know, we're all, you know, all the same class, the same point that Jacob was saying. And the point I meant to make at that meeting last, uh, last year was, Last year, I, I, my daughter woke up in the morning really distressed about her mum's situation. And uh, her mum, you know, my ex-wife, she's remarried. And, uh, and uh, her husband, you know, was under threat of, uh, of losing his job. You know, he was going to be uh, taken into work. And uh, I may give him some advice to prevent him from getting uh, unfairly dismissed. Now, you know, I did obviously gave my help to, the, to this guy, not just because he was my my ex-wife's husband, but obviously that's important to me. But it was my, my, daughter's, um, my daughter's stepfather, but also he's, he's a Muslim. You know, he's, my ex-wife's married a, a, an Egyptian who's a Muslim. And uh, I think, you know, why is he just another worker, a Unite member, trying to fight for his job? And that's what I was trying to do, is, you know, you know, is seeing that, you know, seeing through that, seeing uh, the differences. And quite often, I think, you know, when we, we come to some sort of uh, discussions or meetings, quite often you know, a label can be you know, banded around for people's misunderstandings and labelling people as racist. Now my, my father, you know, he came from a working class background and he was a, a Labour voter, but you know, he come from the sort of the 30s and 50s and 60s, he, you know, he, you know we're, we're not all perfect, you know, and he, you know, from his own observations, his own upbringings, he had some negative view, viewpoints to, to race. You know, but he was a good working class guy. And, uh, you know, I think later on in his life, I think, you know, he did see from, you know, put made many discussions with me, with my own experiences I was able to touch upon, um, <clears throat> and sort of enlighten him, really, to sort of say that, that we're all together. But I'll finish on another point, was that, uh, uh, what was it, uh, three years ago, I was involved in supporting the Vistian workers dispute, we're going down to the Enfield site, and uh, there was three sites which were at the very start of the dispute where there was an occupation of those sites. And Basildon, which I think overwhelmingly was, uh, was, was a white workforce. But if you went to Enfield, there was every denomination you could think of, of, of workers, black, Asian. And you, know, you could gauge from sort of meeting these people that the day-to-day -day sort of nature of what they were facing at work there were people who were in different sort of camps and opinions and opposition between right on racial lines. But under the dispute, they brought them to unity together. And, uh, but at the end, very end of the dispute, and this is the last part I'll say about, is you know, we're talking so about backwardness of, at times of people who were involved in the labour movement, is that uh, I, I went to one of the last days down there, and while I disagreed, so there was another group that came from another left organisation. Every day they were up there supporting them. And there was a, um, a, a girl who was there, and one of the guys who was the, it was the deputy convener, 
really sexually abused, you know, verbally abused this girl, which was to me was completely disgraceful. But this guy was, you know, was part of, you know, involved in the dispute. So I'm just saying is, you know, that you know, we have to try and take these people along. We have to try and coax them along. Try to understand, you know, get people to understand that we're not we're all the same class, whether we're Asian, whether we're black, whether we're female, male, gay, or whatever, disabled. We're all one class, and we've got one enemy, and that's the ruling class and the Tories. I'd just like to comment on a personal experience as someone who's a short hold, who has a short hold tenancy agreement with private landlord. Um, Mick touched on the lack of rights for people such as myself. Well, the situation is actually worse in many respects than Mick briefly touched upon. Um, earlier this year, we were told that they were going to start charging us for renewal of our tenancy agreement, something which our agent hasn't done until the, the new renewals are coming through. Some of the tenants felt so strongly against this, and bearing in mind we received very little uh, by way of support from our, from our agent with regard to the upkeep of the properties, and we're not allowed to decorate them ourselves, um, that they decided to raise a petition. When the uh, agents caught wind that the petition was going round, everyone received a phone call pointing out that uh, if the petition arrived at the office, uh, the people on the petition would be would not have their tenancies renewed. Effectively, they would be evicted. We all are on six months tenancy agreements. Our landlord will not extend our agreements any further than six months. The reason for this is that, as I understand the legal situation, if we were on a say, for argument's sake, a yearly tenancy agreement, and uh, at the commencement of that agreement we started to cause trouble within the property and with our neighbours, our landlord would have a six month process of uh, legal action before he could evict us from the property. By reducing our, our actual tenancy agreements to six months, it means that regardless of our behaviour, he can have us removed from the property without incurring any legal expenses or having to go through that <coughs> six months waiting before he can take action. Um, so people in my situation have actually, actually only one legal right. The legal right as stated on Shelter's website states that all we can do is refuse access to the property of anybody else. Although if it's the landlord, we can only refuse him access for a period of 24 hours. Um, we, there are, within, the, within the agreement, there are responsibilities that the landlord has to the tenant, and there are tenant's responsibilities to the landlord. But interestingly enough, as, as Shelter puts it, if the tenant attempts to hold the landlord to any of his responsibilities, you need to be aware that the landlord might choose to evict you rather than live up to his responsibilities. So at the end of the day, we pay rent, we have no secure tenancy in, re in, in any real terms, and we have no rights. That's what it's like in the private sector when it's a short-hold uh, tenancy agreement. And that's something like 90% of people on short-hold tenancy agreements. Um, and that's the future that this government and probably future governments wedded to the capitalist system want to introduce for the whole of the working class. Going on to questions of, um, of racism against travellers uh, and picking up on some points that my comrade made over here, um, I think it's important that we recognise that borders are a construct of a capitalist system. Prior to 1905 there were no immigration laws you could move freely throughout the world. As the capitalist system grew and developed, it instigated border systems and border controls to control the movement of workers across the globe. It's that that also feeds into the ideas of nationalism and then feeds into the, to the racist arguments that all governments use in times of stress. And equally, when times get hard, when economies, become, when economies are under pressure, Governments use racism as a means of deflecting criticism of the government themselves, the same way that councils will use those same processes. That's part and parcel of their tactics for controlling and splitting the working classes. As my comrade said, what we need to recognise is, it doesn't matter where you come from, what lifestyle you have, we are all the same, we are all human beings, we're all struggling against this system that seeks to exploit us. And we need to bear that in mind. And we need to use that as part of our argument when we're dealing with people who seek to either attack the way we choose to live our lives or attack us because we come from supposedly foreign countries.
Um, at, at a previous uh, meeting uh, organised by a Harbour Trade Council, the, the point was made that British workers are facing an earthquake. That was the point that was made. An earthquake in, in terms of living standards, the NHS, I don't need to uh, spell it out in a meeting like this. But it's an earthquake that's going to leave every political party that we have now completely changed in the next five or ten years. But part of that earthquake is down to housing. When my parents were married, my wife's parents were married, they both lived with their um, in-laws. And um, I've got two kids, 21 and 19. There is no way on God's earth that those kids will be able to afford a house or get um, a council house uh, when you know when they eventually leave home. And I can see the possibility, I'm dreading it. <laughs> I can see the possibility that one of them in the mid twenties or late twenties will come and say, Well, we're getting married and come and move in. It's, it, it's history turned full circle. And housing is one of those uh, elements of social crisis that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I can see the possibility of big movements of rent strikes, big movements of tenants organisations, just like you had in the 30s and just like you had in the 1920s. You've had a slight taste of it in Scotland over the last five or ten years where tenants have got together in organisations to prevent bailiffs, bailiffs coming to sequester goods and things like this. And it, it, it was successful and I can see that beginning to happen on a huge scale, on, 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 on a massive scale. And I think those kind of struggles are important, linked to the trade union movement, linked to the labour movement in general. I, I, I think it's going to happen. There was a really interesting article in The Guardian this week about the way workers in Greece are actually improvising and getting around the problems that they face. For instance, by having farmers coming into the town and selling their, selling their produce directly to workers and cutting out the middlemen and selling potatoes and, and goods at a third of the price they normally pay, where workers are getting together to form communities to kind of help each other. It was almost like a barter system. And one of the points that was made, just a little quote, that somebody actually said that we're not learning new things, we're just relearning things that we've actually forgotten. And I think that that sense of community spirit and community solidarity it is going to come back. It's going to be forced upon us because of the, because of the crisis we, uh, we're facing. But I think it, 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 addressing me remarks here that people like Bob and Wahid and other people I know on the Labour Party, it's also a political struggle because we've got to fight inside the Labour Party for socialist policies and the socialist answer to housing. A socialist answer to the housing crisis. I was turning my hair up when uh, uh, Ed Miliband was on television a month ago and he said, well, you know, the first thing you've got to do, the first priority you've got to do when you're looking at housing waiting lists, and I was waiting for him to say something uh, you know, good, he said, was to kind of sort out your priorities. He said, no, 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 I'm thinking, no. The first thing is to build more houses when you're talking about housing waiting lists. The Labour government in the 60s put a half a million houses a year, a half a million houses. The most that's ever been built in one year. And it's a struggle for us inside the Labour Party. And we've got to take this up, Bob, for genuine socialist policies, for the Labour government to adopt policies of nationalisation of the land, nationalisation of the building companies, nationalisation of those companies that provide the raw materials, to provide the unemployed building workers with the wherewithal to actually build council houses. It's no good just having a wish or a prayer. You've got to have that kind of, that kind of thing built into the Labour Party's programme. It's perfectly possible, given the, uh, given the skills and expertise, given the unemployment among the, within the building industry, given the land, given the materials, it's perfectly possible for us to build a million houses a year in this country. And that's the kind of policies that, uh, that will go forward. I, I don't want to go back to the 1930s. We've got to look forward to a different kind of policy and a different kind of programme from the Labour leaders.